This brings us to a wonderful problem. Which of the following compounds has an asymmetric center? Now keep in mind when I'm trying to find an asymmetric center, which is once again also called a stereocenter, a chiral center, or a chirality center, what I'm looking for is a carbon atom with a tetrahedral geometry that is bonded to four different substituents. I hasten to point out that carbon is not the only atom capable of forming a stereocenter. That is, it's not the only atom on the periodic table that can have a tetrahedral geometry. But in our class for organic chemistry at an undergraduate level, it is the only atom that we're going to focus on. Let's look at each of these examples. In example one, I've got a carbon atom that's stuck to a chlorine, a methyl, a methyl, and a hydrogen. Is that a carbon atom stuck to four different things? Well, obviously not. So this molecule does not have an asymmetric or chiral center. In molecule four, I've got a carbon stuck to a chlorine, chlorine, hydrogen, and methyl. Obviously not stuck to four different things because these two chlorines are the same. You can see as we scroll down that it becomes obvious that answer number three is the only molecule that possesses a carbon tetrahedrally bonded to four different items. A chlorine, a methyl, a bromine, and a hydrogen. Hence, molecule three is the answer. Here's another question. Estriol, one of the three major estrogen steroids produced by the human body, has the structure shown here. Circle all of the stereocenters in estriol. Now one thing that I hasten to point out is that anytime we see a carbon atom in a molecule that's only bonded to apparently three different things, as in this example right here, I've got a carbon atom stuck to an oxygen, stuck over here to a carbon atom, and stuck over here to a different carbon atom. There is always going to be a hydrogen atom bonded to this carbon atom in the middle that just hasn't been drawn. I'll go ahead and draw that here. The three-dimensional direction in which this hydrogen atom is pointing will end up being the opposite of that in which this oxygen atom is pointing. Thus, the OH is attached to this carbon in a wedged format, whereas this hydrogen is stuck to it in a dashed format. Now, you'll notice that in these rings, I have four different carbon atoms, one here, 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 and here, that are indeed also bonded to four different things. In two cases, up here and down here, none of those things is a hydrogen. In these cases, there are hydrogens, and their bonds have already been drawn. Thus, as I look around and determine which of these carbon atoms are bonded to four different things, I see one here, 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 and here. Consequently, I can conclude this, that this molecule contains six stereocenters, which I will let you circle on your own. Now, some molecules have the ability to rotate plain polarized light when they're placed in a special machine called a polarimeter, which I've pictured here. I don't want you to get bogged down in the details of how this machine works. I just want you to understand that there are certain molecules where if I dilute them and put them into a machine like this, the machine will fire plain polarized light at those molecules and the molecules will rotate the light in one direction or the other. Such molecules are said to be chiral or optically active. Now molecules with tetrahedral stereocenters are chiral. There are also some other types of chiral molecules that don't have tetrahedral stereocenters in them, which we won't talk about until a later chapter. Now, as mentioned, chiral molecules rotate plane polarized light, and such molecules are said to be optically active. Molecules that rotate plane polarized light clockwise are called dextrorotatory. Molecules that rotate plane polarized light counterclockwise are called levorotatory. Now what you should know is that, once again, every single molecule in the universe that has a tetrahedral stereocenter is a chiral molecule. That is, if I put it into a polarimeter and fire plane polarized light at it in solution, it will actually bend or rotate the light in one direction or the other. One thing that you need to understand is that enantiomers of each other rotate light by the exact same amount, but in opposite directions. So if I had one enantiomer pure in a container put into a polarimeter, and it rotated the light clockwise, then if I had a pure container with the opposite enantiomer in it, it would rotate the light by the exact same amount counterclockwise.
Which brings us to a wonderful problem. Which of the following statements correctly pertains to a pair of enantiomers? I believe I provided you with enough information to do this on your own. Here's another one. A mixture of equal amounts of two enantiomers is what? A, it says, is called a racemic mixture. Is that true? Well, as we discussed earlier, the answer is yes. Now, is optically inactive? Hmm, that's a wonderful point. And it brings up an important topic. As I mentioned earlier, if I use this magical machine, the polarimeter, and I have a vessel containing a solution of one enantiomer pure, and that enantiomer rotates the light clockwise, a vessel that contains its opposite enantiomer will rotate the light by the exact same amount counterclockwise. What if I took both of those two mixtures and I poured them together so that I have a racemic mixture, that is, a 50-50 mixture of both enantiomers? What do you think would happen if I fired plain polarized light at that? Yeah, you're right. I would get no rotation. In other words, a racemic mixture is optically inactive. Why? The reason is because one enantiomer solution will rotate the light in one direction by a certain amount, but the opposite enantiomer will rotate it by the exact same amount in the opposite direction. Thus, the two will cancel each other's effect out. And as a result, a 50-50 mixture is optically inactive. So this statement is also true.